But as we come to this passage of Scripture and we look at verse 18 down through the end of the chapter, the next couple of weeks are going to be tough. And we want to just, we want to be clear about what the Bible is saying. We don't want to weaponize this portion of Scripture, but yet we want the truth and we want God to be true even if we ourselves are found to be liars. And with that comes a strange silence. In, in fact, if we were being honest, a strange silence has fallen over the church in our time. And, and when people are being quiet, it's kind of like my kids. When they get really quiet in their rooms, I start wondering what's going on, you know? When, when things are quiet and, and it's what's not being said that speaks more loudly than words... And if you look at the conversation in the church in our day, it sounds a whole lot like self-help. The goal seems to be a better version of yourself more than it is anything else. And there's certainly some benefits from the gospel that our life becomes better with Jesus in it, but that is not the whole of the gospel. I hope you understand that. In that environment, doctrine is light, theology is thin, and so much so that the idea of God being angry is a stumbling block. That, that the idea that God could have wrath towards sin offends our modern sensibilities. And Verse 18, let's go ahead and read the text just so that we can wrap our minds around it. And we're only going to read down through verse 23 because I don't know if I'm even going to get through those verses this morning, but that's where we are. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Verse 18 seems abrupt after verse 17. Verse 17, justification by faith, that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The righteous, the justified, shall live by faith. Verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That seems abrupt. Verse 18, we read on, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his, God's, invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so, portions of this scripture down through the end of chapter 1 really seem like they are written about our culture today. Do they not? And as I said a moment ago, I want to be careful not to weaponize this portion of Scripture, but, but, but here's the thing. When we put verse 17, where the righteousness of God is revealed from the gospel, and then his wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, when we put those things together, here's what, here's what we come up with. That people are sinners. We established that last week. A and God graciously justifies sinners who put their faith in Jesus Christ. God does that in mercy and grace. And so why the sudden departure from faith to wrath, from justification to judgment? It, has, it, it really is as we discussed last week, and this is an important conclusion before we move forward through the remainder of this chapter. Without a proper understanding of sin, there can be no true understanding of grace. And without a proper understanding of wrath, we can't appreciate grace. And, and if, if I may say this, there is no gospel without wrath. We are not delivered from anything but our guilt. And if we're guilty, then we are rightly and justly 
under the wrath of God for our sins. And without that understanding, there can be no appreciation of God's grace in the gospel. Interestingly, when you look at the Bible as a whole, that God's wrath is expressed this way. Sinners deserve wrath. Rightly, justly, are condemned for their sins. And people must feel the awful weight of God's wrath before they can desire to escape from it. I need to be clear about that. Because the church has kind of got a bad rap. And may, it may be rightly so over the last few decades. And, and kind of out of the, the, the revival movements of the, the mid-19th century and the crusade efforts to, to evangelize America, that, that there, there was a, a great deal of fire and brimstone preaching. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and that has its place. When, when we read this text, we realize that that has its place. Until we understand that sinners deserve God's wrath, we'll never desire to escape from it. And so that, with good intentions, was presented as a means of drawing people to faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's the deal. The Bible speaks of it often. It's essential to the gospel of grace. But, I think, the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction. We had a great amount of fire and brimstone preaching decades ago, and now the church is mute concerning the wrath of God. Don't talk about it. It makes us uncomfortable. It offends, as I said a moment ago, our modern sensibilities. It's a stumbling block to think that God could actually be angry. So that said, we need a refresher course. And I hope you're with me. I want us to understand some things over the next few weeks. We need to understand the, the nature of God's wrath. We need to understand the grounds of God's wrath and the measures of God's wrath. And, and we're going to try to work through this part by part, and, and come to a necessary conclusion at the end of the chapter. And so now if you look back with me at, at verse 18, Romans chapter 1, let's try to wrap our minds around the nature of God's wrath. Because one of the stumbling blocks that we all face when we think about God being angry is that we think God is angry like us. That God gets mad like we do. And, and, and we weaponize that because we think God is mad at what makes us mad. And if, you're, if, if you make me mad, then God is mad at you. You understand? We've done a good job of that, haven't we? And that, that's where this, this idea of a, of a tribal God comes in, where, where God somehow is for this group of people and actively opposed and against this other group of people because they're different. And that's not how God gets angry. Okay? So let's work through this part by part so that we understand the nature of God's wrath. First, I want you to notice with me that it is intentional. When God gets angry, it is on purpose. God never reacts like we do. That the, the Greek word translated as wrath in this text refers to a settled, determined, almost premeditated indignation. That it's not a reaction. It's not an explosion it's not a fit of uncontrolled anger. It's not an outburst. That's not how God gets angry. God is very settled and determined, calculated with his wrath. So we need to understand that. It, it is felt, and, and, and in the fact that God feels it, it's very similar, I suppose, to the wrath of man, the anger of man, but God's wrath does not have the sinful qualities that its human counterpart does. You understand what I'm saying? Let me explain. God doesn't kick the dog when he's angry. He doesn't slam the door. He doesn't bite and devour the people that are next to him when he's angry. He doesn't drive down the highway in a fit of rage because somebody cut him off, that, that he doesn't lay on the horn at a stoplight because some, you know, I had that happen to me this week. Fawn thinks I'm really quick on the horn too, by the way, but the light turned green and I didn't even have time to put my foot on the gas pedal before the person behind me honked. God doesn't get angry that way. God's not impatient like that, okay? You understand where I'm going with this? 
that, that, that God doesn't scream at the wait staff because the order was wrong or because the food came out cold. God's not an abuser. You with me on that? God doesn't get angry like that. That's what we do. That's how human people get angry because our anger is tainted with sin, but God doesn't get angry that way. God is never irrational or unreasonable. He's always just, and his wrath is always intentional. Are you with me on that? And so right there we begin to understand the difference between God's anger and ours. It's intentional. Number two, it's divine. We're talking about the wrath of God that is also revealed from heaven, that its source is different. And so let's understand this. When we talk about the wrath of God, we are actually speaking of wrath being a divine attribute of Almighty God. And so right there we understand that God's attributes are balanced, that his wrath is balanced within the perfection of his holiness. That God's wrath, God's anger about sin is never going to outstrip his righteousness. That he's never going to become so angry where he acts sinfully towards someone. You with me on that? That he's never going to be so mad that he's going to be so full of rage and fury that he's going to become unrighteous. And so, please hear me. His wrath, because it's one of his attributes, is perfectly balanced within the perfection of of holiness. Now that said, when we start thinking about God's nature, if he had no righteous anger and wrath, he would not be God. Just as surely as he would not be God if he did not have gracious and perfect love. That he perfectly hates sin, and, and let's be clear on that, God hates sin. He perfectly hates it. He righteously hates it, just as he perfectly and righteously loves people. Are you with me on that? They work in tandem, harmoniously together within the perfection of his holiness. And so God's holy hatred of sin is the only response that he could have toward it. He could have no other response to it, that, that God hates it. And bearing in mind his other attributes, please hear me on this as we try to put this all together. A God who was all-knowing, a God who knew everything, that there was not one thing that escaped him, not one thought in your head, not one feeling in your heart, and not just your heart and not just your mind, but everyone's hearts and everyone's minds at all times, God knows everything. In a God who knows everything, but somehow turned a blind eye to evil, would not be just. You understand the inequity in that? A God who is all-powerful, that, that, that holds the universe together with the power of his will, but refused to act when confronted with evil, would not be righteous. A God who is present at all times and, and in all places. That, that God was actually present as a witness for every single atrocity ever committed on planet earth. Because he's everywhere present at all times. But was ambivalent toward what he witnessed. Was uninterested in the outcome. Would not be kind or benevolent or gracious. You understand where I'm going with this? God's wrath towards sin is essential, intrinsic to his nature, and without it, he would cease to be God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It's divine, just as it is intentional. Thirdly, it is known. God makes it known. It's manifest. It's obvious. And, and, and let's be clear about that from verse 18. That God makes it known. God reveals it from heaven. Just as he reveals his righteousness in the gospel, God reveals his wrath towards sin from heaven. So listen to me. 
Everybody look at me for a minute. We don't discover the wrath of God through experimentation or through research or by human logic. That, that God makes it known by lifting the veil and uncovering the truth and making it known that it is divinely sourced, its origin is with God, and He makes it known. Are you with me on that? The, the, the most comprehensive revelation of this is found in the cross, that God reveals His wrath against sin, His hatred of sin in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, if you, if you think back with me to our study through the Gospel of Mark and everything that we talked about concerning the crucifixion, and even what we've talked about in the last few weeks, the Son of God bore the full force of God's fury and the full weight of His judgment on the cross. That, that God poured out His eternal wrath and indignation against sin in six hours upon the eternal Son of God as He was nailed to the cross. And so when we look at that event, the crowning event up to this point in human history, embedded within the blaspheming of his accusers and the beard pulling and the cursing and the slapping of his tormentors, in every lash of the whip, every thorn in his brow, every hammer blow that drove those nails deep within his wrists and his feet, God is revealing his feelings toward sin. And when we look at the cross, we don't just see an act of mercy and grace where God chose not to punish us in mercy and instead punish Christ in grace. We see God's hatred for sin. You want to know how God feels about our blaspheming? We look at the cross. How our adultery, our fornication, our wandering eye, look at the cross. How God feels about our greed, God, look at the cross. We look to the cross, and in that God-forsaken darkness, God made his ground-shaking wrath known. And he put his only begotten son to death. He did it. God killed his own son because that was the only way that his wrath could be righteously absorbed. You understand? You read through passages like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, it's very clear God did it. Acts chapter 2, Christ was delivered up and crucified by the hands of sinful men according to the predetermined plan of Almighty God. God did that, and in it reveals from heaven his feelings towards sin. There's also a future aspect to this, a future tense to this revelation of God's wrath. It's not just something we look back to at the cross, but we look forward to in the second coming. That, that the word translated as revealed here is apocalypto. We get our English word, you guessed it, apocalypse from it. And oftentimes when we hear that word apocalypse, we, we think about the end of all things. We think about that the suffering and the tumult and the, the trials of the end times, but that's not what the word means. The word means an unveiling. It literally means to reveal. And, and every time the scripture speaks of such things, or, or commentators speaks of such things, they're talking about the revealing of the second coming of Christ, not just the, the struggle of the end times. And so that's what we get here. When God lifts the veil, we look forward to a day when Christ will return. And when he comes, the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance upon those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He came, his first advent, his incarnation, born of a virgin, lived 33 years as a sinless man, God and man, so that he could absorb the wrath of God. When he comes back, that's been paid for. He comes back in judgment. And so there, this revealing of wrath is something that we look forward to when God returns 
with all of his mighty angels and everything is put right. Amen? And so we understand as we, we look at all these things put together that, that it is intentional and it is divine and it is known. But let me tell you something, it is also hostile. Number four, just in case you haven't put the pieces together, that, that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It is against, God, that God is actually hostile toward ungodliness and unrighteousness, that it is against that. And so Psalm 711 tells us that God is angry with the wicked every day, that his discharge of wrath is against people who deserve it. It's focused just as it is intentional. Now, let me remind you, we've already talked about this, but God is not tainted by sin. He is not corrupted by vengeance. God doesn't get angry like we do. That God's wrath is reserved for and justly directed at ungodliness and unrighteousness, that it is focused, laser-focused on those two things. Now, those two words, ungodliness and unrighteousness, are, are worth a look as they, they seem to focus on two different categories of sin. Many scholars attribute them to the Ten Commandments. That, that the Ten Commandments can be broken up into two similar compartments. The first four having to do with your relationship with God. The, the last six having to do with your relationship with your fellow man. And as we put that together, our failure to honor God, to, to have no other gods before Him, to, to honor the Sabbath and to keep it as holy, to, to revere His name as holy, to, to not bow down to any graven image, to worship God in the wrong way, our failure to honor God and to love Him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength, is all encapsulated in that term, ungodliness. And you guessed it, our failure to love our neighbor as ourself is wrapped up in that term unrighteousness. That's how our failure to love our neighbor as ourselves is defined in unrighteousness. And so when we have, let me speak to the men for a minute here, because Jesus talked about this, Paul talked about this, and just, just think with me, just as an example. When we have a lustful thought for a woman who is not, ours by covenant of marriage then then that is a failure first of all to love that other person as we love ourselves and so doing paul says we defraud our neighbor we are failing to love our neighbor as we love ourselves that is unrighteous when we envy them or we're jealous of something that they have or or we want to take from them something that we want we steal from them we are failing to love them as we love ourselves. Do you follow with me on that? It's all wrapped up in that term, unrighteousness. And so, but here's the point. When we understand this, that God's wrath is directed at ungodliness and unrighteousness, we have an understanding of what it is exactly that God hates. And God hates sin, and that's the only thing that he hates. That, that's the only thing. I can't say that enough because we've weaponized the wrath of God in the church. That God hates sin and that's the only thing that he hates. He does not hate liberals. Or Democrats. He doesn't hate Republicans or conservatives. That God doesn't hate the rich or the poor. God doesn't hate the talented or the untalented or, or the successful or those that struggle putting one foot in front of the other. God doesn't hate anyone. God hates sin. And so I, I hope you understand the rest of the chapter won't make sense until we have a complete understanding of the fact that God hates sin, and that's the only thing that he hates. God doesn't hate people, regardless of your political persuasion or your past or your means or your education. God doesn't hate people. God hates 
sin, and it is the only thing that brings his wrath. Are you with me on that? Now, now that we understand that, let's talk about the grounds for God's wrath. N the nature of God's wrath, I hope, is now clear in your mind. Let's talk about the grounds for God's wrath. What draws his ire? We, we, we understand that God hates sin. God loves people, but he hates sin. And so what do people do that would bring his wrath? And there are three of these, and, and, and we'll, we'll give them to you as quickly as we possibly can. And so look back with me at verse 18, the last part of the verse. And, and the first grounds for God's wrath is the suppression of the truth. God's wrath is against un, ungodliness and unrighteousness and, and the suppression of of the truth. And so, let's talk about this. Let's talk about how this works. God has made known the truth about himself to mankind. But instead of responding to the light that they have been given, people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so let's be clear about this. We're not talking about ignorance. We're talking about arrogance and there's a difference we're talking about rebellion and rejection we're talking about somebody who has come face to face with the truth and instead of acknowledging it it's not even the fact that they turn away with from it that they suppress it they push it down and reject it in unrighteousness they try to bury it in their arrogance and Paul later in verse 19 talks about what can be known about God has been made plain because God has shown it to them. So let's be clear on that too. That, that, that God is actively making himself known. That God wants to be found. God is not keeping himself a secret. God guarantees that the person who sincerely seeks for him will find him. That's what Jeremiah 29, 13 says. That if you seek me with all of your heart, God promises that you will find him. That God's not going to turn anybody away who responds to the light that they've been given. And so if you have been given some light, have been given some understanding, the Holy Spirit is going to work in your heart, you've heard the word of God, if you'll do the next right thing, God promises that you will be found by him. That God will not leave you in the dark, but draw you to the light. But here's the deal. People aren't naturally inclined to seek God, are they? Because we're sinners. We're not naturally inclined to seek God. Jesus said this in conjunction with John 3.16, the, the, the great encapsulation of the gospel. But in, in verses 19 and 20, John chapter 3, that men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. And everyone who does evil deeds hates the light. And so the suppression of the truth is, is measured in kind. I hope you understand the connection there. God hates sin. Sinners hate light. They don't want to come to the light because everything that they've done is going to be exposed. They have to deal with it and bring it out into the open and it has to be repented of so that it can be atoned for and graciously forgiven. But sinners, sinners hate the light. And so this is willful rejection and suppression of the truth and unrighteousness. And it's just grounds for God's wrath. People who hate the light are justly under the condemnation of God Almighty. Secondly, there's the rejection of general revelation. These things all work in tandem. Verses 19 and 20, according to these verses, what God has made known, God has made it plain, is universal. And so when God testifies about himself in creation, that's known as general revelation. And so, so it's enough, general revelation is enough to point every person on the planet to God. That's why the Bible says that they are without excuse. 
that God can righteously hold all people accountable to the knowledge that they've received from general revelation, from creation, the witness that he has placed in creation. Now, general revelation is not enough to save someone, but as we just discussed, if they will respond to that light, if people will respond to the truth that they see in creation, God will not leave them in the dark, but will draw them to himself. There are countless stories of people that I have met in my Bible college days from places like India. There's a man named Baba, who missionary Hemet Patel, was. he was the first convert of his in India. Baba sat one day outside of his dwelling and watched a dog, a stray dog, urinate on his idol on his front porch and thought to himself, if my God is not strong enough to keep a dog from urinating on him, then he's not God at all. And began to seek, God, if you're out there, reveal yourself to me. I want to know you. And within a few weeks, Hemet Patel came by. And that's, that's not an isolated occurrence. That it is happening by the thousands in Iran in Afghanistan, in those countries that we would think from from our safe place in America that are so dark and repressed that Jesus Christ is revealing himself to thousands of people on a daily basis because people who respond to the light that they are given will be drawn by the Holy Spirit to saving faith in Jesus Christ. God will not leave them alone. Amen. Amen. God did that in your life too, by the way. It may not be as self-evident, but that's exactly how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. And so when we think about the witness of creation, that, that the scripture says the eternal power and divine nature of the transcendent God are knowable, able to be perceived by us in what we see in creation. Psalm 19, 1 through 4, explains that the heavens, the starry host, the moon, the sun, all the constellations, everything that we see when we look out on a clear night and in the beautiful, sunlit, bluebird sky of the day testifies to us about God. They declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. He is not left without a witness anywhere in the far reaches of all of his creation. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And so here's what that means, loved ones. That if you're skeptical this morning and you're listening, that the evidence that there is a God is all around you. It's perceivable. It's knowable. All you have to do is look with your eyes with a desire to understand with your heart. You see it when you look under a microscope and, and, and you look at the, the minutia on a cellular level or, or on an atomic level. That, that You see it when you look at a telescope and, and you see the far reaches of our universe and the majesty that we see and the beauty that is that we behold declares the glory of God. Biology, chemistry, physics, all of those sciences reveal divine order and design. Just like we can look at a painting and we can know the painter, we look at creation and we know its creator. The evidence is within you, too. It's not just all around you, but it's within you. It's stamped on your heart, and guess what? It's written on your face. When you look in the mirror, when you look at another human being, we see it. We see that we were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of our Creator that God stamped in our very DNA on our appearance, His own image, the way that we think, the way that we feel, the way that we act, all of those things are God's image, because that's who God is. That God feels, God thinks, God acts. That God is a 
revealed to us in three different forms. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And man is body, soul, and spirit. And it's all around you. And it's within you. And anyone, listen, anyone who refuses to look objectively at the evidence of creation is rightly and justly under the wrath of God. Refuse to acknowledge the testimony of what they see. And by the way, what we see in the scientific community right now, and I'm not a scientist, but I've, I've read enough and I follow enough people on, on both sides of the aisle that, that people who look objectively at the science realize very clearly that there is order in design, that, that, that we were not spawned from chaos. We did not rise from the, group, the goo in, as a single-celled soul organism, that, that there is clearly divine design in creation. But that knowledge is suppressed, you guessed it, in unrighteousness. Not in knowledge and not in wisdom, but in unrighteousness. And then also, we see thirdly, the third thing that draws God's ire, the third grounds for his wrath, is the idolization of creation. So, when we kind of put all this together, we see the suppression of truth, we see the rejection of general revelation, re revelation and then we see this idolization of creation itself, verses 21 through 23. And so when, when people see the witness of God in creation, the starry host, the moon, the sun, when they, they, they look not just at the cosmos, but at the cellular level, when they see in the mirror the image of God imprinted upon their very soul, the proper response to that, according to the text, is gratitude. That, that we respond to the light that we've been given with gratitude, but instead of being thankful, when people look at the stars or at the face of another human being, people choose to ignore it. They ignore God. They come up with a version of their own reality, and they're plunged, according to the text, into further darkness. And as they're plunged into further darkness, their search for knowledge and answer to questions that have already been answered in creation, they begin to ask futile, speculative questions. All those questions that I've already said have been answered in creation and that, by the way, is not wisdom. According to the text, that is foolishness. It's misguided. That professing themselves to be wise, what does the scripture say? They became fools. And so as people reject light, it brings darkness. And what we see here in verse 23 is the first of three exchanges in this chapter that people exchange the glory of God for the glory of his creation. That they literally barter and trade away God's majesty, God's power, God's glory, and they trade it for what he has created. That we were talking about this this morning, Fawn and I were, that we see it in the Old Testament example in the people of Israel, that that, that what God gave them as symbols of his power, as a reminder of his presence, instead of seeing those things and standing in awe and, and, and being grateful to God himself for what he had done, they worshipped the things that he gave them. That They began to worship the ephod that the priests wore, which was a, a vest with jewels on it, and, and that the ark of the covenant was treated like a good luck charm. And so long as they, they rubbed the rabbit's foot, you know what I'm saying? That they'd be blessed and they'd be victorious in battle. And, and that's, that's not at all what God intended those things to be used for. They were, reminded of his, they were a reminder of his word, a symbol of his presence and his power. They, they were to look at those things and remember what he had done for them. They were to honor God and be thankful. But instead, what did they do? They bartered away the majesty of what God had done for them, the majesty of his presence, that, it, that his presence with them was exchanged for an idol. And that's, that's what people do. We're prone to do it. We might not do it 
with a statue or an image or, or an ark that is overlaid with gold, with cherubim, with their wings outstretched, but, but we do it with our own traditions. That we trade away the power of the Holy Spirit working within us for the things that make us comfortable and make us feel safe. And instead of walking in, in step with the Spirit, we've exchanged the power and the glory and the majesty of God's presence within us and it work through us for those things. And we see it, it you know, it, it, it's a self-evident example in, in pagan cultures where they bow down to images of, of animals that, 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 that they think the, that there's a sun god and a river god and all of those different examples. We can see them, that's self-evident. But what might not be so self-evident is the idols we've come up with in our own hearts. And, and by the way, this exchange that we're talking about, and that's the word that is used here, and it literally means to trade away. It's not an equal trade. It's not apples to apples. It's not dollars for donuts. You know what I mean? It's not equal. Mankind is getting ripped off. And, it, and it's not God stealing from us. We're stealing from ourselves. Let me be clear on that, 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 that this exchange is not equal, that the light that has been given is traded away for foolishness. And so instead of getting wisdom, we get darkness. Instead of getting more light, we get darkness, that light produces darkness, that the freedom that is promised produces enslavement. And in, in wrath, God gives those who exchange away his glory for other things, no matter what those things are, God gives them what they want. That that, that, that that is the first thing that God does in wrath is he simply gives them his absence because that's what they wanted anyway. Isn't it? That's what Psalm 2 says, that the heathen rage and they desire to cast off the chains of the Almighty and to be free from His power and free from His control. And they, they want a life to, to live in freedom by their own devices. And if there's ever a mantra that describes what's happening in the American culture, it's that. People want to be free from God. And guess what? If that's what you want... God will give it to you. Something that you might enjoy temporarily in this life. But you'll suffer for in eternity. And, and that, that is why we need to sense the weight of God's wrath. Because God may give you what you want right now, but he will allow you to reap the consequences of your choices and your actions forever in eternity if you suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So please hear me. This is the point. We're, we're not talking about the wrath of God and we won't be talking about the wrath of God over the next several weeks to make you afraid. That's not my goal. That, by the way, that's not the Holy Spirit's goal in the scriptures either. It's not to create this us versus them mentality. It's us versus the world. It's moral people against immoral people. That's not at all what this is. The point is evangelism. The point is that people would sense the weight of God's wrath so that they can desire to escape from it. You understand? A and that we... They, all people, would look to the cross and there not only see how God feels about sin, but see what God did about it. And Jesus bore it completely and satisfied it to the nth degree so that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. By faith in His name, we can be delivered from wrath not just present wrath, but the wrath to come by faith in his name. 
And so the good news is, as we will find out in the later chapters of the book of Romans, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so if you're in Christ, if you've by faith confessed him as Lord, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you are in Christ, you are not under wrath. Hallelujah. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But if you're not, you need to feel it. And listen to me very carefully. God perfectly loves you just like you are. But he also righteously and perfectly hates your sin. And will not leave you in it. That, it, that, it, that it, you're here or you're listening online and you're hearing these words, that's proof to you. I hope the Holy Spirit is testifying to your heart right now and to your mind that God is going to work on you. That, that the Holy Spirit is turning shovels of dirt in the soil of your heart and the Word of God is being planted and the Holy Spirit is drawing you to faith in Christ. You've received light this morning. Don't reject it. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to draw you to the Father so that you can be saved. Amen? As you, as you sense the weight of God's wrath, God's hatred of your sin, allow the Holy Spirit to draw you to faith in Christ. Don't leave here afraid. Leave here delivered. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, help us. Help us to be thankful, Lord, as we, as we look at the evidence all around us in creation. That this morning, as we were getting ready for church, and we were brushing our teeth and combing our hair and getting dressed in the mirror, we saw not just a human being, but somebody who has been fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of their Creator. That this afternoon, as we look across the table from those who, with whom we will share a meal, that we are seeing the image of Almighty God. And when we see that, Lord, help us to be thankful. Tonight, when we step out on our back porch and we look at the moon, or that when we see the rain, and we see trees with green leaves and flowers in full bloom, that, that Lord, you're declaring yourself to us and Help us to respond to that light with gratitude. Thank you. Father, I pray that you would help us from the scriptures also to see the truth about your wrath. You're not silent about yourself and you're not silent about how you feel about sin. And so, Lord, as we sense that weight, we rejoice in Christ Thank you for delivering us from wrath, not just now, but to come in Christ. Lord, I pray, I sincerely pray, it is my heart's desire that those who do not know you would feel it and be drawn to faith in Christ this morning. Would you do that, Holy Spirit? Would you accomplish the will of the Father in them and draw them to salvation in Christ this morning? Please, God, do it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Let's sing this song together. Can we put the words back up on the screen? And if you're in Christ, I want you to worship, sing this song. But if you're here today and you need to confess your faith in Christ and be delivered from the wrath to come, I invite you to do that to you today. Listen to the words of these songs and, and come to the altar.